my pleasure to be here in for Science on the Hudson. As you can tell, the Hudson is very near and dear to me. In, when you introduce yourself in New Zealand, you speak about where you're from, who your tribe is. You also say what your mountain is and what your river is. So when I was in New Zealand, I, when I said my pepehe, I said, and my river is the Hudson. So it's wonderful on my river. Um, <laughs> so today, about one of my favorite continents, and show you some of the mysteries there. Hope you walk away understanding how it's changing and how it matters to all of us and what we might do. I'm just here as a storyteller. I think it's one of the things that often we forget us. When we think about science, we think it's like these single people. And it's certainly the case here at Nevis that science is a team sport, that really you can't do any of these big, hard problems without wonderful collections of engineers, programmers, uh, I use pilots, pilots, um, students, people who drive tractors. You know, those are all part of the teams that without which I couldn't do this, the science and tell you the science stories and make the discoveries that we do. So I'm humbly grateful to them all. And here are just some of the many people who've helped along the way. My intellectual home is on the other side of the river. It's about 2.8 miles that way. Um, it's at Lamont. It's, up, it's another Columbia property on the New York, New Jersey border up on top of the cliffs. Um, while, you know, physics, Nevis is physics at Columbia, where Lamont is geophysics and geo everything at Columbia. It's where some of the fundamental discoveries on plate tectonics uh, were made. It's where some the real notion of climate change, past, present, and future has developed over the years, where one of my friends down the hall was the first team to predict an El Nino, something we now think is relatively normal to be able to do. Um, we work on earthquakes, quiet and complex, volcanoes, geophysics on the moon. One of the fellows on my advisory committee was sent a heat flow probe to the moon and it was actually the first time an astronaut swore and then apologized because he tripped over it <laughs> and pulled all the wires out and it didn't work for another three missions, but he both swore and apologized to Mark from the moon. And as uh, you heard, we've also done a lot of work on the Hudson River. Um, you may have seen this map. This is sort of the emblematic map that came out of the early days of Lamont. Marie Tharp made it. Um, brilliant woman who understood that that mountain range down the middle of the oceans is actually the continents moving apart. There's a wonderful Google, Google Doodle if you want to learn more about Marie Tharp and how she came to make this map. But she al there's also been a long history at Lamont of working in the poles. This is Marie's early black and white map of the North Pole. And it, even in the 1950s, Lamont scientists were going to the North Pole on ice islands. Uh, Margot underneath was the first woman to surface to on, the, on a nuclear submarine on, uh, at the North Pole as she was mapping it. So there was a long history of work in the polar regions and in Antarctica. But my, my pleasure is to actually look underneath the ice. But let's start by putting the ice back on. This is Marie's rendition of what's underneath the ice. So given that she made it in the 1970s, it's a little fictitious. But this is what we know today. We're putting the ice back on. And this is how most people think of Antarctica big, white, boring place. Or otherwise, they might think it's just full of penguins. When you think of Antarctica, you think, I'm just going to see if I can move this away. See if we can get a little less feedback. Can you still hear me? Yes. OK, and less annoying. Mm -hmm. Maybe. We'll try this. Just like New York, there's a lot more in New York than seagulls. In Antarctica, there's a lot more than just penguins. And in fact, the penguins are really just around the edge of that continent. In the years I've worked in Antarctica, I've probably only seen penguins four times. 
just because penguins live in the ocean and most of Antarctica looks like this. Most <laughs> Antarctica. Yeah, right? It's, you just wouldn't believe a couple of things. A, it's so flat. B, the sky is so blue. I used to think people were messing with the sky. But in fact, in these images, the sky is really stunningly blue. Um, and there are no penguins. There are two parts to East Antarctica, clever, to Antarctica cleverly called East and West. <laughs> one's in the Eastern Hemisphere and one's in the Western Hemisphere, so East Antarctica and West Antarctica. And they're actually very different pieces of ice. And we'll see about how Antarctica grew and then why these bits of ice are different. 34 million years ago, which geologically isn't that very long ago, those, those cliffs on the other side of the river, the ones that you look at when you go down to get on the train, those are about 180 million years old, those rocks. So the fact that the ice sheet in Antarctica is 34 million years old means geologically it's not that old. Um, but 34 million years ago, there was no ice on Antarctica. It was unglaciated. Um, there are actually dinosaurs and trees in Antarctica before this. Um, but this is CO2, and this is global temperature. And can you see what happens between about 50 million years and 34 million years is the global temperature drops. And guess what's also happening is what really kicks it down is when the global CO2 starts to drop. This is, turns out Antarctica is the place that we really began to understand this connection between CO2 in the atmosphere and global temperatures. But when that CO2 dropped about 34 million years ago, you grew the first ice sheet in Antarctica. So Antarctica, w the mountains we're going to look at, are actually the birthplace of that ice sheet. Oh. As the time continued, we eventually got cold enough we could cover the other half of Antarctica. And then for the last about a couple million years, we've been in this grow, shrink, grow, shrink period. But, you know, with about 100,000 year cyclicity, there have been ice sheets sitting right on top of Nevis and Lamont in New York City, about a mile thick. And they've come and gone and come and gone with about a 100,000 year cycle. And this is what it looks like. Very big ice, very little ice. So we've seen that wax and wane. So it's no surprise to us that ice can change because it's changed in the past. And when we look at Antarctica, you can see, if you see the little sort of river-like things coming out around Antarctica, those are, in fact, flowing ice. Ice flows. In fact, even though the ice in the middle is two miles thick, there are rivers of ice, so you can think of them as glaciers, draining the ice sheet out from the middle of the ice sheet out to the ocean. And if you pull it off the ice, here's the ice, and if you pull it off, there's beautiful terrains underneath. And that's what we're going to look at in a little bit more detail. We'll come back and look at these long profiles. We'll look at them both right now, actually. So if you look at them, you can see it gives you a sense of how thick the ice is. Right here, it depends on what units you like. Two miles of ice. <laughs> this mountain range we'll come back to is the size of the Pyrenees. Not exposed. But there are parts of Antarctica where, I like to think of there are parts of Antarctica that are kind of like Canada. They're up high, they're old. But then there are other parts of Antarctica that are a shallow ocean. That ice is actually thick enough that it's gone into the ocean, but its bottom is below sea level. So we call that a marine ice sheet. Because it's below sea level, it's way more sensitive to changing ocean temperatures than the piece that's sitting up high, than the piece that's sitting in Canada. It would be like having a piece of ice, say, sitting in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, in that shallow water, not the temperature of the Gulf of Mexico, but in the shallow water, it's more vulnerable. So this is a, an idea we'll come back to, that these pieces where the bottom isn't sitting up high away from the ocean, but is sitting down low, are more vulnerable to change. But how do we know this? How do we know this structure? Well, we began to learn this in the 1950s during the International Geophysical Year, where you know, we put the first, you know, first satellites went into space, Sputnik went up, and one of the other big advances that came during the International Geophysical Year were 
um, the launching of major expeditions across Antarctica that zigzagged in what are basically the same kind of things you see at ski areas that groom the trails, only they drove along, had little huts that people would live on, and then they measure gravity, and every once in a while they'd blow off some dynamite. And when they let the dynamite off, they'd measure how thick the ice was. So those were the measurements that are very first indication that the ice in Antarctica was thick. Before the International Geophysical Year, we thought the ice in Antarctica was maybe a thin little scum, maybe something like the Alps, where it might be hundreds of meters of thick. We didn't think it could be four kilometers or two miles. So that was, you know, other than going into space, one of the big ahas in the late 50s was, oh my gosh, there's a lot of ice. Since then, we've learned that you can do things faster if you can do them from a plane, that it's a lot easier and faster to fly over terrains than drive. What I've done much of my career on is putting different, different airplanes. This is one that I have just a resident, uh, Nick Frearson, who lives up here in uh, Terrytown, which we hung on the outside. We used a lot of equipment on, uh, we measure, we use radar to do the same bouncing of energy off. We measure magnetics to tell us how magnetic the rocks are. We measure gravity to tell us are. And we usually shoot a laser so we can do a very precise mapping of the surface, trying to do everything we can to understand the character of the ice sheet. So what do we see? We well, mostly look at the radar because uh, that's what tells us when there's water. Um, this is on the left-hand side is what a radar image looks like. So what you see on the top is you see nice layers. So this is like 20 kilometers at the cross at the bottom. And this is about two kilometers top to bottom, so about a mile. Nice layers. Probably the ice at the bottom here is about 300,000 years old, so pretty old. Um, mountains underneath the ice sheet. And then the thing that always surprises us when we first see it is that there's water underneath the ice sheet. Always surprising, because the surface, it's, if you were to stick a thermometer and it's about minus 50 is the average temperature of the surface, minus 50 C. But at the bottom, it's clearly warm enough to melt. So the question is why? Well, if you ever, those of you who live in houses, you know if you go down in your cellar, the cellar tends to stay the same temperature, right? That's because there's actually ge background geothermal heat coming up and keeping your, your cellar more or less the same temperature. And that heat comes up and warms the base of the ice sheet over time. So the base of the, the thickness the ice can get to is really dependent on how much heat's coming up. If you're over a volcano, you have thinner ice. If you're over cold, old, continental crust, you can build a thicker ice sheet. So we now know that there's water under much of the ice sheet. And this is what the average temperature is there. And the water underneath can look everything like a very thin film. I spent a long time trying to figure out what to picture it. I walk around and think, what did the water look like when it was here, when there was an ice sheet here? It might have been a thin film, like you get underneath an ice cube. Um, I'm going to show you there really can be a big lake, not one you can sail on, but still a big lake. There are probably rivers, slow-moving rivers. There are probably gushing streams, I'll show you some evidence for that. And there are definitely big places of uh, flat water underneath the ice sheet. So th when we, there was hints of water underneath the ice sheet, but the real clear evidence came when we were first able to map the surface of the entire <coughs> continent. And see that little lima bean shaped structure where that red arrow is pointing? That is a place the size of New Jersey that's pretty much flatter than the runway at Newark Airport. And so what does that mean? If you've ever gone out skiing on different places, if you go skiing on a glacier in the Alps or in the Canadian Rockies, you'll find that that ice is pretty rough. It kind of follows the terrain. But if you go to the Adirondacks and you ski on Avalanche Lake, a frozen lake floating, that ice is flat. So in fact, you're seeing the same, 
physics, the same floating ice on the ice surface in Antarctica, where that rough stuff is like the glaciers, where the ice is sitting on the ground. And the very, very flat area is where the ice is floating on top of the ice sheet. So that's a pretty big piece of ice. It's to over 200 kilometers long, so think from the top of New Jersey all the way down to Cape May. It's four kilometers of ice. And the liquid water covered when we measured the gravity over it is up to a thousand meters. So, you know, a little more than a half a mile. Really big piece of ice. It's also where the Vostok ice core, that's one of the very first places we saw the warming, cooling, warming, cooling in lockstep with the CO2s because the unique thing with an ice core is you can actually recover what an ancient atmosphere looks like. Most records you can't, not with tree rings, not with sediments, but with an ice core you can actually see what the composition of an ancient atmosphere is. So, this is, there are lakes all over the place. This just happened. In fact, if you go back and look, once you realize that's a lake, it really doesn't take much to realize that those two off on the right have to be lakes. It's one of these moments where you're standing in a meeting and everybody's looking at the great big lake and you go to the person standing next to you and like, does anybody notice the lakes all over there on the other side? And you get to, you know, with a bunch of friends, make a discovery just then and there because people have been looking at the big elephant in the room. Um, so this is Lake Vostok. You can see it actually sits, part of it sits below sea level, but it's surrounded by mountains. But this was kind of this magic place that I've been thinking about for a long time. It's a mountain range that was discovered in that during the International Geophysical Year, that same process where they drove along, measured gravity, and shot off <laughs> seismic every so often. Um, and they defined this, they kept on thinking it was going to come out, it was going to come out, they were going to find rocks. And for a long time, even in early in my career, there were rumors of there being outcrops in the middle of the ice sheet. Turns out those were somebody's figment of their imagination, there are no outcrops. But you can see as they were driving, it was getting closer and closer to the surface. But it was a, th this is the picture we had for almost 40 years of what the ice, of what that mountain range looked like. There was some sense that was really tall, there was some sense it might have been carved, but we didn't know anything about it. Cold, hard to get to. Here's another image of sort of what we used to think of it. It's really close to the pool of pole of inaccessibility. That tells you how hard it is to get to, which for some reason the Soviets put a picture of a statue of Lenin in the middle of it. the ice sheet. Um, it's been hidden from the sky for 34 million years. It was just really hard to get to. We had a dream of going there. Um, we kept on proposing. We, we think this is an important question. This is the birthplace of the ice sheet 34 million years ago. It was really hard to build the commitment to go there. Um, we were rejected, like all good scientists, you were rejected several times before we were actually able to get there. And we also realized that no nation could get there by themselves. And that's actually one of the reasons <laughs> I stepped forward and helped organize the International Polar Year, was realizing that I was never going to be able to do some of these really hard <laughs> problems as long as a single nation was mo doing it by itself. Um, we did manage to get an influx of funny funding and collaboration for the International Polar Year, and I had the honor of leading this Seven Nation project. So once we got there, it meant going to McMurdo, which is the furthest south you can get a ship. It's where Lam Columbia, is, where, where NSF has their large base. You can land planes here, and then we had to go to the South Pole to acclimatize because this is high enough that you have to worry about altitude sickness with people. It's higher than the South Pole. And then by the time we got here, we realized we had a very, very narrow window to work in because there's only a certain time of year at that elevation that the temperatures are warm enough that you can actually operate aircraft. When you get temperatures below minus 40, um, aircraft don't work very well. Neither do people. Anyway, so th this is just gives you an idea of what it took to get to the Gamberts of Mountains again. It took seven nations. It took two high elevation camps and a acclimatization at South Pole. I had to promise that we wouldn't be a burden on 
people like Ice Cube and all the other science at South Pole. He had to promise my people were not cookies in South Pole. We had three different survey aircraft. We had to have four C-17s. This is, a <laughs> this is what a C-17 looks like. We filled it with fuel and then we threw it out the back because that was the only way we could get the fuel to the places we need. Sometimes we had the fuel dragged in on bladders by um, giant tractors. And we had 37 C-130 flights from the New York Air National Guard bringing us fuel and support from the Traverse. It, was, it took a lot to get there. And you can see why science is such a team effort. Um, this is what it looked like, our little, one of our little camps. You can see we lived in these little Quonset hut types buildings or out in a tent and we all our uh, that would be an outhouse that would be a f uh, the american flag and we had a science happening over in our small buildings so what what does a science expedition look like when it gets there remember we had four weeks to fly something was the size of california it was pretty much uh plan where to go fly fix things pull the data off, worry about whether or not people are getting enough oxygen, wait for weather, fly, fix things, eat, take the data off again and again and again. We, were, we had two airplanes and two, air, and two crews, both for science and for flying, and we were keeping the aircraft in the air about 20 hours a day as much as we could because we knew we had this, we only had four weeks and it had taken seven nations to get us there, and I felt it's like, boy, if I blow this, I've really, you know, when is somebody going to get back here again? And it was magic as we went along. Um, we would actually sit around and see this map of the mountains grow. This is actually a, a picture of a piece of paper I walked away with a field in. But you can see where all, all the scientists are sitting around thinking, oh my god, we're actually seeing this grow. So after four weeks of doing that, you know, all that repeat, fly, eat, sleep, fly, eat, sleep, uh, we actually flew every single one of our planned lines and plus a couple over to some lakes and there was suddenly this moment, it's like, oh my God, we did it. I don't think I realized until I was on the plane somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. And it's like, oh my God, we finished it. It was, and what you could already start to see is this sense of there being deep river valleys in this mountain range. But, so that's what, you know, that's the sense of where we went. It's the top of the ice sheet, those are those contours. The ice sheet's very smooth, but Dome is the tippy top of the ice sheet. And underneath there was this mountain range, and in every valley we had seen water. Which surprised us. When you write a proposal, you say things like, we'll find lakes, we'll study lakes, and you think, oh my god, there's not going to be lakes here. If, but we, in every single valley, you see that, remember that bright reflector where the energy comes back really strong. We found a bright reflector in every one of these valleys that's looking down at the mountain range. You can see, you know, it could be somewhere, somewhere in the west here where you're looking out the airplane window and seeing how the river valleys have cut. And when we look, every single valley had those little green dots that shows that there was water in them. And when we began to think about it, it's like, there's the valleys and there's the water. But when we think about it, the, those rivers must be running backwards because normally the rivers would run down my arm, right? But when you put an ice sheet on top of it, you're going to be squeezing that water uphill. So every single one of those rivers was probably running backwards. That was one of the things we, you aren't supposed to do science when you're in the field. You're really just supposed to get the data because it's such a unique thing. It didn't mean we didn't talk about it, about what we were seeing and think about it. Because we were also seeing these weird things. I'm now I'm just going to show you what the raw data looked like while we were flying along. Remember, most of the ice sheets supposed to look like this. Nice pancake layers. And then maybe some mountains underneath. That's what we were seeing. And maybe some water. But we began to see this stuff. They look like clouds coming off the top of the mountains. They're not supposed to be clouds underneath the ice sheet. It's supposed to be nice layered. Then we saw these things look like giant mountains, or maybe a dental. These are actually notes from the people who were flying. It looks like a dental anomaly. It has a magnetic anomaly. It's like, what? 
<laughs> this is where you say, this must be a mistake with the data. This is our imagination. This can't be real. But then you fly the line next to it, and the fly the line next to it, and it, you, you image it again and again, and you fly across it, and it's still there, and you start to think maybe you aren't imagining it. Um, or and sometimes they just look like great blobby things. She's a little bit more measured in her response. Strong offline reflector. She was still not convinced they were real. She thought they might be an error. But then we began to think about these things were being associated. We were starting to see that these things were associated with water. I forgot to tell you that the bottom of Lake Vostok freezes. That when they drilled that hole, they actually found lake water that was frozen onto the bottom of the ice sheet. And when we imaged it, it looked like a triangle coming up off the bottom of the um, lake. So here we see that same shape. It's like, hmm, there are these weird reflectors coming up off the water. Maybe it's related. Um, and we went back and we thought about these some more. And then we do what good scientists should and map them out because that's how you try and make sense of them. And there they are. Suddenly we find out that these giant blobs of ice, as we call them, that are up to half the thickness of the ice sheet and up to 60 kilometers long, they all are at the ends of the valleys. So suddenly we have this realization that not only do we know that the water runs uphill in these crazy mountains, but it freezes on to the bottom of the ice sheet and gets carried away. Kind of reversing your entire sense of how ice sheets grow. We think of ice sheets growing from snow falling on top. Um, we still haven't sampled these, but they're really clearly along the ice flow, and we saw them coming off the other side where the other camp, the uh, Australian British camp found them too, making us really believe that this was a real process. And again, this is remember, sometimes you do things in science where your competitors say, you're wasting money. I can't believe you're going here and doing this experiment. You're wasting money. Well, this is the first paper I've gotten into science without basically no comments. It's like, this is just amazing. So when you look at the mountain range, you suddenly realize that these structures on the base of the ice sheet are almost as big as some of the mountains. So this is how my view of East Antarctica has changed over the years, from being sort of this boring flat place to being this place with giant lakes underneath and a mountain range with something that looks like it's been carved by rivers where the water runs backwards. And just to give you a sense of how old that ice sheet is, this is this layer is about 60,000 and down here is about 120,000. Below that I can't really follow the layers, but you know, most that ice gets to be up to 800,000 years and I have friends who are looking for the million year old ice. So this ice sheet's pretty stable. It's big. It has a lot of sea level rise potential in it, but it's not what we as scientists worry about going because it mostly sits up high. The ice sheet we are worried about is younger. This is the one that, remember, there was a two-phase growth, first East Antarctica and then West Antarctica. We worry about West Antarctica because West Antarctica sits low. It means that the warming ocean can reach its bottom and sort of nibble away at it and make it flow faster. And we have evidence that it has not been as stable in the past as East Antarctica. And then we look at how old it is. And like, it's 60,000 years at the bottom. It's really not as old. But just in case you think it didn't have amazing features underneath, it also has remarkable lakes. Only its lakes are tiny. They're kind of more like puddles. But don't tell my friend how on that. They're, they're actually things she discovered one weekend when she was about to go away. And she was looking for places where the ice would go up and down. She was actually trying to look for the tides. Here, we'll go back and look at it again. Um, what you're going to see is you see that round spots on the ice surface. What she saw by looking at laser measurements is she saw one place in the ice sheet would drop a couple meters, and then another place about 15 kilometers away would pop up. 
And they eventually figured out the only thing that could be describing this process was water moving between lakes, these little swampy basins. Uh, compared to Lake Vostok, they were swampy. Um, basins beneath the ice sheet. So this ice sheet is very, very different. It doesn't have great big lakes, it doesn't have great big mountains. It has a very dynamic water system underneath that moves. And what does that mean? Remember, this is susceptible. We do see this ice sheet changing. Um, we can see it changing now. Uh, we're going to zoom in to this area in a couple different ways and see how this part of it, West Antarctica is changing. Up here is the things that really struck us as scientists when we saw them go were these big ice sheets, ice shelves disappearing. But we're going to look in at this um, evidence because this, I'll show you, if I was talking about the Hudson River, I would tell you about this data because I think everybody should be aware of this data. So somebody asks you, are the ice sheets changing? You can say, I saw the evidence and yes, it really looks like the ice sheets are changing. So we're going to zoom in and look at laser altimetry in the same place in West Antarctica. And we're going to start, no, we're going to start with ice velocity. We're going to see how this area flows. And you can see in the 1990s it was flowing about two kilometers a year. And then we leap ahead to the 2000s and it has doubled. So it's now flowing four kilometers a year. Okay, so it's flowing twice as fast. We now watch that same place turn yellow over this pretty much the same time period. Now, uh, when ice flows, it's kind of like the mozzarella cheese I had on the pizza tonight. When you bite it, it stretches. So it means when ice goes, ice goes faster, it actually gets thinner, so it gets lower. So we're going to look at this movie again, just because that way you know what to be looking for. First, you're going to look at the speed, doubling in speed from the 1990s to the 19, from the 2000s, so it goes from being purplish to being closer to red. That's a double in speed. And then you're going to look at the formation of that yellow area, coincident with where it's sped up. And that is where the surface of the ice sheet dropped about 60 meters over the same time period because it's getting stretched and thinned. We see that same effect in Greenland when we see it happening. The ice isn't flowing. It's flowing out of rock-bounded places, and there you can actually see bathtub rings where the ice is getting lower. So scientists like multiple measurements of things. What I've shown you is two different measurements of the same thing. I've shown you the ice speeding up, and I've sh which is made with one instrument, and I've shown you the ice getting lower another measurement. Now I'm going to show you a third measurement. I'm going to show you a measurement. It's a measurement of gravity from space. It's an estimate of how much it weighs. So um, we're going to watch, this is a time series, and we're going to watch in that same place on the lower left. You're going to see that same orange space growing as you see the mass loss from that dropping is speeding up the dropping, and then we also can measure a mass loss. And you can see that's been going for, we've been measuring that for almost um, two decades now. So a very, very clear single. And you can also see why we're less worried about East Antarctica in this image, because you're seeing all of East Antarctica. You can see East Antarctica in the upper right. You can actually figure there are places that it snowed more. Um, so there are actually is mass being added to parts of East Antarctica. This place appears to be losing mass in East Antarctica, but it doesn't at all match the place where the most warm water is hitting Antarctica. So this is the evidence we have that Antarctica is changing. Um, I'll show you the same images for Greenland, but we're just going to stick with Antarctica for now. Um, this really has local impacts around the globe. Um, you can go to wherever you go. This is a picture from um, Senegal. And you can see that the, uh, this is Ile de Gore, where the uh, Pope apologized for the involvement in the slave trade. And you can actually see that the rising sea levels are chewing away at that space. You can see 
we can go and look at places where it's being measured. In the next slide, I'm going to show you everywhere there's an up arrow, um, sea level's going up. And these are not very high-tech measurements. These are measurements made by a piece of an instrument in the water measuring the tides. There's some places it's going down. That's mostly places that are bouncing back still from the last ice age. So what do we think is going to happen? We think that in the next 82 years, it could go up somewhere between one and two meters. So that's somewhere you know, up to my waist or up to my head. Um, has it been going up around here? Well, if this is if you went down to the Staten Island Ferry. Right next to the Staten Island Ferry, there's one of these instruments. Um, there's my, just to give you a sense, there's my grandmother. She was born in 1898. Um, there's the record. Uh, this is 1898. <laughs> there was a gap in here. But you can see the, the trend's pretty clear right there in, um, in Battery Park. It would be up, this is where I'd like you guys to put your hand down somewhere just below your knee and think that that's how far sea level has come up since my grandmother was born. You know, about uh, 14 inches since my grandmother was born. Um, it's happening here on Piermont, you know, across the river where we run a lot of summer programs down on the, on the, on the pier. Uh, the storms are wetter, stronger. We saw that this week or yesterday in Tampa. Um, the sea level is higher when Sandy, the, the, flip through here. This is what Piermont across the river looked like afterwards. They had to clear the roads in Piermont with a bulldozer. I, it was not something I ever thought I'd see. And that storm, that the storm surge is what caused this, the, you know, the 11 foot storm surge. But it went way further inland because of that foot higher than it is since my grandmother was born. But it's not just sea level. We actually see change everywhere. Um, Recently, this summer, when I stood back to think about it, you, know, you can feel, smell, and taste climate change. Um, you can, you know, this summer we felt, um, or last summer you could really smell the wildfire and the Canadian wildfire. Every year you can see your daffodils coming up sooner and your basil lasting longer. And the things that you're tasting on your table are different. And there's data behind this. I'm not making this up. You know, there's an increase. This is time across the bottom. You can see there are more um, wildfires and forest fires with time. You can see that this is this is how long the growing season is, and on average in the U.S. it's 10 days longer. Some places it's 40 days longer since the 1970s. That's why the daffodils are coming up sooner. And the other, so that's why I think you can smell it. The other way is we're actually seeing that where we're catching fish offshore is changing. So I like to think this is the taste climate change. Um, this is latitude, but if you don't think in latitude, like most people across the river do, um, this is Kitty Hawk, Chincoteague, Tom's River, and Plymouth. And you can see where you're catching sea bass has moved from sort of being between Chincoteague and Kitty Hawk, and is now up closer to Tom's River. Uh, the, where you, the, the center of where people are catching lobster has moved from Tom's River to north of Plymouth. This is why it's so hard to have uh, much of a lobster catch anymore in Connecticut. The lobsters aren't there anymore. So we can see it, we can taste it, we can feel it. It's really, so what can we do? Um, you know, human hands are behind us. It's ice cores, if we were to look at it, will really show that, you know, the CO2 we're seeing is off the charts. It's a long time since we've seen that. Um, I don't like to be the doom and gloom person because I'm actually not. I am convinced we can do something. We can all take action, whether it's individual organizations or governments, local and national. I'll start with the individual because of my household, that's what we talk about all the time. Um, we talk about what we can do as individuals. And so in, nine, in 2018, I actually figured out this is the year and how much my CO2 footprint was. And I figured out where I was using CO2 as an individual. And for me, it was mostly flying for work. 
or maybe doing in the winter when I started to burn more um, CO2. This is my husband wrote this book called Live Sustainably Now, the steps we as individuals can take for, um, for making an impact and making a difference. Um, you know, it is the reason we sailed around the world as opposed to go around the world any other way. Um, we just got back from a two-year circumnavigation. and The reason we sailed was really to be able to demonstrate that you can see the world if you're patient. <laughs> patient. <laughs> that patient part matters. Um, but you, know, it doesn't have to, you don't have to sail around the world. You can do things as an individual, whether it's switch your, your contract to solar buy an electric car. There, there's a lot of things you as an indi as in, we as individuals can do. You can also encourage your organization, what, where you work, to think about this is um, Lamont's solar farm. There's, try asking to cut down the trees on the other side of the river and see what the people on this side of the river would say. But <laughs> So we ended up with a solar farm upstate where it was less controversial, but it does provide our electric leads. Our professional organization, our Geo the American Geophysical Union, that has a um, population of about 120 climate and earth scientists around the world. We had to re renovate our building in Washington, D.C., and we chose to do a net zero renovation. So we actually had the first net zero renovation of an office building in um, Washington, D.C. Again, demonstrating that we as a community are taking this seriously. Um, it took everything. It, this, to me, was a lesson that you can't just do one thing. It took solar panels, it took LED, it took, took green walls, it took a, a heat exchanger with a sewer. You can't, it's not a simple one bullet fixes it all. Um, our virtual world is making a big difference. Every time we choose not to fly to a meeting, we save tons and tons of carbon. Um, the year that we didn't, we only had a virtual annual meeting, we saved about 80 thousand tons of CO2. So there's things we can all do. We can, you know, the uh, current, the Inflation Reduction Act is improving the net, the electric infrastructure. It's a lot easier now to drive an electric car around. Uh, it's much quicker. So I'd like you to leave you with a thought that our, you know, our, our planet's beautiful. We're really lucky to live on this planet. But our footprint on this planet are big. And it's our responsibility to figure out how to build a thriving but equitable and a sustainable future for all. And if you want to know more, um, our open house is on October 19th. I left postcards, if you like postcards, or you can just scan the QR code depending on what you like to do. But we'd love to have you come. We're going to have a lot of our it's a whole day where we bring out lots of science toys and you can learn everything from how to make a garbage can into a volcano to how ice flows and how earthquakes happen. Um, we would love to, we'd be honored if you were to come visit us um, on October 19th. So I think with that, I'll thank you very much for coming tonight and entertaining your questions. <laughs>